Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Schultz. I am the Water Education Specialist with the California Department of Water Resources and welcome to Water Wednesday. The mission of the California Department of Water Resources is to sustainably manage the water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state to benefit the state's people and protect, restore and enhance the natural and human environments. We started Water Wednesdays about 10 months ago in response to the COVID-19 stay at home situation. And each Wednesday we are joined by a DWR scientist or subject matter expert to learn about California's water, our aquatic ecosystems and more. This month we are talking about watersheds, what they are, why they're important and some of the risks that they face. Last week's speaker talked about some of the impacts that wildfire can have on watersheds and how DWR monitors water quality in their aftermath. If you missed his presentation, you can find it as well as all of our other past presentations on our YouTube channel. You just go to YouTube, type in California DWR and they're all there for you. This week, we are joined by Cassandra Evenson a senior environmental scientist up in the Lake Oroville region. And Cassandra is gonna be talking about some of the different ways that we protect our watersheds. Before I think, turn things over to Cassandra, I just wanna go over a few logistics for those who are joining on Zoom. As you saw when you uh, joined us, your microphones and cameras are off. This helps minimize background noise, distractions, um, but we do want to hear from you. So um, we encourage you to submit questions that you have for Cassandra. And when she's done with her presentation, I will read those to her and we'll get as many of them answered as possible. So the way you submit your questions is go down to the bottom of your screen, hover over that bottom half inch or so, and you'll see a box that says chat. Just click on chat and uh, you wanna go ahead and you can send the questions uh, to me to, um, where it says my name. And um, like I said, we will get through as many of those as we can. We do have a live captioner with us today. So if you would like to have captions on while uh, you're uh, listening to Cassandra's program, you just scoot over a little bit on that same bottom bar and there's a box that says CC, closed caption under it. And you can turn the captions on or off, whichever is your preference. That pretty much covers Zoom. And so I am going to go ahead and turn things over to Cassandra. Hi, thanks for joining us today. Hello, thanks. All right, let me get this started. Look good? All right. Looks great. All right. Hello, everyone. As Kathy said, I'm Cassandra Evenson, a senior environmental scientist at the Department of Water Resources and the Environmental Section Supervisor at the Oroville Field Division in Butte County. I lead a team of environmental scientists that make sure the work we do here in Oroville follows the laws to protect the environment, which includes caring for and protecting all the benefits we receive from our watersheds. Some of the cool jobs my section does includes monitoring nesting bald eagles that live around the lake. Currently, there are five nesting pairs. We also work with other environmental scientists to monitor the water quality of the lake and river, like Daniel Wisheroff, who presented last week. We use the data collected to determine if there are any problems that need to be solved. For example, when monitoring the bald eagles, we make sure that our recreation activities on the lake do not interfere with the success of the baby eaglets that hatch each year. The data we collect for water quality is used to determine if the water is safe to swim and play in during the summer months. My office is located at the Oroville Dam, which holds back the waters of Lake Oroville Reservoir and is within the Upper Feather River watershed in Northern California. In the picture is Bidwell Bar Bridge that spans over the lake along Highway 162. The Feather River watershed covers five counties. I'm going to talk about some of the environmental laws that apply to all of us. And because our watersheds cross so many borders like county and city lines, why it is so important that we collaborate on our actions to protect them. In my job, collaboration means to work cooperatively with scientists and engineers here at the Department of Water Resources or 
or at other agencies to determine the best ways to protect our watersheds. What county do you live in? Does your watershed cross city or county boundaries? What do you think would happen to our watersheds if we didn't all work together? Protecting our watersheds works best when everyone pitches in. As we've learned this month, we all live in a watershed, which is the area that drains from the ridge tops to our waterways. These could be streams, rivers, lakes, or reservoirs like Lake Orville, an estuary, wetland, aquifer, or even the ocean. They supply our drinking water, provide recreation, and sustain life. Looking at the map on the right, the Upper Feather River watershed located in Northern California is in the box. The dark green area is the Sierra Nevada mountain region, which is the primary watershed that supplies water to us all. Within the watershed is Lake Oroville in the circle on the left. The forks of the Feather River, the north, middle, and south flow into Lake Oroville as they collect rainwater starting at the mountaintops. The river is a major source of the state's water and provides virtually all the water delivered by the state water project, which I'll be sharing more about shortly. The North Fork Feather River starts with streams tributary to Lake Almanor, and after joining the East Branch North Fork, continues downstream to Lake Oroville. The North Fork is the only one that collects water from both the Cascade and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. The Middle Fork Feather River originates in the mountains above Sierra Valley and continues downstream to Lake Oroville. There are two reservoirs owned by the Department of Water Resources, Frenchman and Lake Davis. Sadly, the Middle Fork was badly damaged by the 2020 North Complex wildfire. The South Fork Feather River lies mostly within the Plumas National Forest from its headwaters downstream to Lake Oroville. The area was also badly damaged by the wildfire. There are three reservoirs on the South Fork that we do not own. They are Little Grass Valley, Slide Creek, and Ponderosa. Have you ever been swimming, fishing, or even wakeboarding on a reservoir or lake in California? The State Water Project is the largest state-owned, multi-purpose water project in the country. The system spans nearly the entire state, from the Upper Feather River Reservoirs and Lake Oroville in Northern California, where I sit, all the way down to Pyramid, Castaic, Silverwood, and Paris Reservoirs in Southern California. The system of water passes through multiple different watersheds. That is why we need to work together as a state to make sure our actions are unified in protecting and preserving the many benefits. The state water project benefits to Californians include delivering water to 27 million people, farmland irrigation for hundreds of thousands of acres, lots of recreation for us all to enjoy, and healthy habitats for plants and animals to thrive. The Department of Water Resources manages 34 reservoirs and lakes so that we all have a reliable water supply. While we have fun on the water, there are rules we must follow to make sure we don't mess things up so that the plants and animals have a healthy place to live too. A system of reservoirs, rivers, aqueducts, pipelines, and power plants make up the state water project. Looking at the map on the right, can you see if a river or a pipeline delivers water to where you live? To operate and maintain the state water project, environmental scientists ensure that the activities comply with all the laws. We collaborate and use the best available science and data to develop the environmental protection measures. Does anyone know where to find information that we collect called data? You can go online to the California Data Exchange Center. We call it CDEC using the acronym CDEC. The Department of Water Resources manages CDEC to support real-time flood management and water supply needs. You can also find lots of data on the Water Data Library. Environmental scientists are skilled at finding ways to avoid impacts to the environment. But when impacts become unavoidable, we collaborate and develop special protection measures to minimize the potential for harm. For the last few years, I worked on the Oroville Spillways Repair Project overseeing implementation of the environmental protection measures. If you haven't heard about it, back in 2017, heavy winter storms damaged the main spillway. The repair project took about three years to complete. During that time, we made sure the water quality of the Feather River was protected from all construction work. The environmental scientists collaborated with engineers to develop, to develop ways of protecting the river. A measure that is still in use today and can be seen from roads and trails around the dam is the straw wattles. 
The waddles are staked along the topographic contours of the hillside to keep loose dirt from making its way to the river when it rains. It, this is called erosion. The scientific measurement of dirty water like this is called turbidity. We also installed continuous data collection systems that are floating on buoys in the lake upstream and in the river downstream of the project to monitor water quality parameters, such as turbidity. This is the kind of data you can find on CDEC or in the water data library. Thousands of feet of wattles were installed on the hillside to control erosion. Wattles are made of straw inside of a tube made of a biodegradable netting. When it rains, the water that flows over the newly completed construction project can collect loose dirt and carry it into our waterways. The wattles slow the flow of dirty water and allow it to settle and separate so it flows cleaner. After the wattles were installed, a mix of native, se native seeds and fertilizer were sprayed on the hillside. The mixture was applied all over the bare dirt before the rainy season began. The grass was able to grow fast enough to help the ground stay in place through the winter. Applying hydroseed after a construction project is another very important measure to improve and protect water quality. Can you see the wattles and greenish colored hydroseed mix on the newly constructed hillside? How many feet of wattles do you think it took to cover such a large area? There are many different laws that protect our environment. The California Qu Environmental Quality Act, called CEQA for short, says we must develop measures to avoid and minimize our environmental impacts. Installing wattles and spraying hydroseed are considered minimization measures that stabilize the ground and reduce erosion. By installing these things, we are also showing compliance with the Clean Water Act. CEQA says that public agencies are responsible for considering how much damage projects can have on the environment. Before we can start work, the law says we must get permits from the regulatory agencies. We must work together and collaborate with them on the things we can do in our projects to protect all the benefits of our watersheds. The Clean Water Act says that everyone must work together to protect our nation's water resources and stop damaging our watersheds with pollution. It also says that you must have the proper permits to build your, your projects. The permits we obtain to maintain the state water project ensure that the work will not impact our waterways. Protecting water quality is always a top priority. Do you know of any fish, birds, or other animals that are protected by environmental laws? To protect them from going extinct, we have the Endangered Species Act. These laws are what protect the bald eagles around Lake Oroville. They also protect animals in all the other watersheds, such as the threatened and endangered salmon that spawn in the lower Feather River below the Oroville Dam. What do you think would happen if there weren't environmental protection laws for everyone to follow? Before we had the laws that we follow today, there was a lot more damage happening to the environment from unregulated levels of pollution. On the left is the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio that flows into Lake Erie. On the right is the Pacific Ocean near Santa Barbara off the coast of California. There was so much pollution in the Cuyahoga River that it caught on fire 10 times between the 1860s and 1960s. Back then, the people did not know they should be so worried. It wasn't until 1969 when the river caught fire again, around the same time that a drilling rig off the coast of California had a major oil spill, that people across the nation started to really take notice that we needed to do more to protect our watersheds. They reached out to the lawmakers in order to stop this kind of devastating pollution. That is when the Clean Water Act was overhauled to be stricter, which was badly needed, as you can see in the pictures. To ensure that no harm like this happens to our watersheds today, we obtain permits for all the work we do for the state water project. These permits provide environmental protection measures to ensure that we keep our watersheds healthy. Have you ever had a project to work on that you needed a team to figure out the solution? Who did you ask to join your team? Did they know something that you didn't? or did they have new ideas to share? We collaborate with many agencies to ensure we are doing everything that is required to protect our watersheds. So many that I won't be able to cover them all in this presentation. But here are a few that we work with quite often. To comply with CEQA, we work with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We also obtain permits from them in accordance with the Endangered Species Act and Fish and Game Code. One of the most common permits they issue is a lake and streambed alteration agreement. To comply with the Clean Water Act, 
we work with the California Regional Water Quality Control Board and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Typical permits issued include water quality certifications and nationwide permits. Other agencies that we work with to follow the Endangered Species Act include the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine and Fisheries Service. These permits are called biological opinions and provide protection measures for plants and animals listed in the law. An example of collaboration that I'm currently a part of is the multi-agency watershed working group in Butte County. This team is being led by the Water Board to monitor water quality impacts resulting from the wildfires that have devastated the watershed around Lake Orville. Together, we collect and share data about water quality and collaborate on solutions to issues that arise. Another way the Department of Water Resources is able to help keep our watersheds healthy is through funding many collaborative projects across the state, which is made possible by our integrated regional water management program. Can you think of ways to help protect your watershed? Protecting our watersheds is a big job that requires everyone to pitch in. What can you do to help protect our watersheds from where you live? One idea is to volunteer in your community to pick up litter along the waterways. Check your local recreation and park district website for opportunities like the annual Feather River cleanup here in Oroville. Don't wash pollutants into the drainage system because it eventually ends up in our creeks, rivers, or even the ocean. Plant native trees in your yard. And as the people of Needsville sing in the Dr. Seuss movie, The Lorax, let it grow. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you. Great, thank Thanks. you, Cassandra. If you wanna um, stop sharing your screen, great. We'll get to some of the questions that came in. Um, one question for you, what, um, what exactly is your job? Are you out there like, watching them, you know, I think it's contractors who put the hydro seat on the, the hillside there. Are you out there overseeing that? Are you more in the office? Um, what, what do you do as an environmental scientist working on that project? Well, I would say both. Okay. <laughs> it's a great combination of office work and field work. So uh -huh. uh, to collect the data or to make the observations, we've got to get out there. We got to get on the ground. We got to make sure every day on a construction project took a team of environmental scientists to, to be all over the place every day, making sure we were everybody was doing what they needed to do to protect the river, so. Okay, great. And as an environmental scientist, that's a, a really broad category. Is there a certain um, like aspect of the environment that you focus on, like fish or plants, or are you more of a, a generalist? Um, I would say, well, we do have specialists. We have um, botanists mm -hmm. and we do have wildlife biologists and we have fisheries biologists. So an environmental scientist, there are many different specialties you can have, or you are you can have a, a broader um, skill set, you know, where you get to uh, work with all of everything, you know, the wildlife, the plants, you know, and when it comes to regulatory, you really do need to know all the aspects, you know, okay. for the regulatory compliance. So you so you're covering all of it pretty much. Yes. Great. That's neat. So there's there's opportunities like we at the very beginning of Water Wednesdays, we heard from some people who were really specialized in what they did. Like you said, some of the fish biologists and um, ornithologists, people that study birds and herptologists, people that study the amphibians and reptiles. But exactly. for people who don't necessarily want to specialize in one of those who like everything, there's opportunities to to work in that as well. Yes, definitely. All right. Um, so uh, we've got a couple of questions. Can you tell a little bit more about what the, the hydro seed is and, and how it works? Well, for a construction project, like the spillway project we saw in the picture, mm -hmm. um, the, the mix is, um, is made up of uh, native seeds for, for grasses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we combine that with a, a sterile wheat grass. And that is the component that grows quickly. Okay. Right? But then uh, it does not regrow after the first year and then allows the native seed mix to take over over time. Okay. And but so that's it not... gets, mm -hmm. so, so it gets the root system going in the soil to mm -hmm. hold the, the ground, you know, on the hillside uh, intact. So we mm -hmm. don't have uh, erosion. 
Right, and that's one of the that's one of the issues with non-native grasses is they can grow faster and outgrow our our native ones. So you get it to grow quickly, but then it doesn't reproduce, so the yes. native seeds can take root. That's why it's sterile. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's great. Is it just grasses, or are there flowers, native flowers, on the hillside as well? Well, in the mix on the spillway, there are some poppies. Oh, cool. Definitely. Awesome. Love love the California poppies. Yes. Um. And you you mentioned um the the wattles that that go on the hillside there how how many miles or feet of, of wattles were were involved thousands with that? thousands thousands and uh i did lose track so i'm yeah. just gonna have to stick with thousands and so thousands of feet of wattles is probably as good as mine it was a lot okay <laughs> all right um let's see i'm, I'm look, just looking through the question here um you you had a picture of the the bald eagles in your your presentation um and you mentioned that there's some bald eagles up in oroville um, yes there are um uh, like i said there was a uh, we um, are monitoring um five nesting pairs mm -hmm. that we know of uh that uh come back to um, lake oroville each year so and at this time of year uh we've just started we've just kicked off um the the nesting season uh monitoring Okay, and, so they're uh, nesting right now. And the biologist that was out there doing the surveys uh, reported back some good news despite the wildfires, right? And mm -hmm. that we have had all five pairs um, or have been observed uh, recently, mm -hmm. you know, so so that's encouraging um, because the wildfire was pretty destructive on just the, the, the habitat, the greater watershed. And do the birds return to the same they nesting site every year? Uh, yes, they prefer. Well, uh, they, can they can go from maybe one nest tree to another nest tree, but it mm -hmm. is the general, the same um, vicinity. Okay, great. Um, so one of the questions is the, you mentioned that in 1969 is when like the Clean Water Act came into play and with the, the burning on the Cuyahoga River and the simultaneous um, oil spill off Santa Barbara, or not when it came into play, but when it was strengthened. Strengthened, strengthened. yeah. I would yeah. say it was previously under a different name mm -hmm. um, that the Clean Water Act is what we know today. And it was a pollution law that mm -hmm. um, I believe started in the late 40s, 48. And um, and it was in the 60s, the environmental movement, you know, that's where CEQA and NEPA, there was lots of laws that came mm -hmm. into play uh, in that time in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just, it was one of those, the pictures show it, the catalyst, you know, mm -hmm. for one of the biggest overhauls for the Clean Water Act, um, which did actually um, come out in 1972. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, around that time, yes, there was, uh, and we, and those laws are what we're still following. And of course there's been additions and revisions uh -huh. and, you know, you got to stay on top of all that too, but. Uh, so the laws, because the state water project was built in the, the early 60s, so the laws have, have gotten stricter um, about how that operates as well since, since it was yeah. built? Yeah, so some of these laws, you know, were enacted at the time of the construction, right? Mm -hmm. So so here we are, um, you know, uh, at least here in Oroville, you know, 50 years plus down the road, and uh, we need repairs, we need, you know, we're maintaining the state water project. So every time we do take action, we make sure we go through all the laws and see what's, you know, what applies to the situation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, take a whole nother presentation or two maybe on to cover all those laws. Right, or an entire college semester class. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so since you get to get out into the, the field sometimes, um, one of our, our viewers would like to know, what is, have you had any, what is your most memorable wildlife encounter while working at DWR? Oh, uh, I guess that's a that's a good question. <laughs> you got me stumped there. Um, you haven't you haven't been buzzed by an eagle or seen a mountain lion from from twenty feet away. Nothing that memorable. Um, I guess uh, you know seeing the eagles. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, and, and then there's osprey, and and watching them uh, hunt on mm -hmm. the lake, and and uh, to come down with their claws and grab a fish. I mean, that's pretty exciting. I, yeah. I did. 
but uh, that was an osprey. So mm -hmm. I, I can't say I saw an eagle do that. That might be a rare observation. Um, no. but, uh, I mean, for, you know, for any of us. <laughs> I think you might be more likely to see the eagle steal the, uh, the fish from the osprey. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to go back. There's there's one more question about the waddles. How long do they stay there? Do you uh, remove well, them, or uh, do they do they decompose? What what happens yes. to them? Yes, and there are different types of waddles that mm. are used on construction sites. Um, so um, the ones that have the plastic netting, not desirable, but mm -hmm. they are used. And those though are definitely not a uh, permanent application. They are, those are to be removed as soon as you're done with, with your, your work. Okay. Now the, um, the netting uh, on the biodegradable um, is, is a coconut core. It's a natural material, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we prefer. Plus it, um, uh, the, the plastic netting um, has been known to um, trap wildlife and mm -hmm. such. Right? right. And so to avoid those kind of bad situations, you know, we always tried, you know, our best, at least, um, well, actually the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, they uh, have a say in, in what type of material, material we use in our projects. And that's mm -hmm. what we get in our permits. That's the environmental protection measures okay. that says when the conditions are such that you have to use the, um, the biodegradable or the, the environmentally friendly or wildlife friendly type of mm -hmm. waddle, then you have to, because that's compliance with a permit and compliance mm -hmm. with the law, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I imagine if you're putting these waddles upstream of a major waterway, you probably don't want a lot of plastic that could, could wash down it. Yeah, not good. Yeah, all right. Well, speaking of um, the fish in there, um, one of our viewers noticed you've got a, a poster of a whole bunch of different fish behind you. And I think those are the fish of the, the of Oroville Lake, is that correct? Of Lake or of Oroville, Delta? yeah. Of Lake it's Oroville? actually a poster that my supervisor, Eric C., created. Uh huh. Oh, about 2008, I think that's the date on it. Yeah. Okay. But uh, to capture the variety of fish that are right here in Lake Oroville. It looks like there's a lot of different fish up there. Uh, yes, I did not have them all <laughs> memorized, which is why they're a poster on my wall. <laughs> Do you have a favorite one or? Uh, I wouldn't say uh, the one that I can catch. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Those are the fun fish. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Cassandra, for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who is watching us online. If you are interested in learning more about the Department of Water Resources, uh, please visit our homepage water.ca.gov. If you have, uh, um, if you're a teacher or a parent with, with children or teens at home, we have a lot of resources um, on our education website, water.ca.gov backslash education, with a lot of links to different um, organizations that um, do water education, as well as a link to our water materials order page, where you can order free materials um, for your kids to learn about water. And if you're interested in exploring the data sets that Cassandra mentioned earlier, uh, you can visit CDEC um, at cdec.water.ca.gov. Uh, in terms of exploring more about watersheds, like Cassandra said, you know, watersheds are huge. They, they stretch across county lines, even state lines, and it takes a whole partnership to, to help keep them healthy. So a couple of other uh, organizations and agencies that have information on watersheds include USGS, uh, the US, United States Geologic Survey. The United States EPA has information where you can look up um, how healthy your watershed is. And then modelmywatershed.org allows you to put in different scenarios into your watershed and see how that would impact the health of your local watershed. If, and again, you know, to hear more about DWR, what we've got going on and find out about our future Water Wednesdays, uh, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. You can also find us on LinkedIn. So we will be back next Wednesday with Jamie Anderson. And Jamie will be talking about some of the impacts that climate change is having on our watersheds, particularly the Feather River watershed, and what we can do to adapt to those changes and mitigate some of them.
So we certainly hope you can join us uh, again next week. Thank you again, Cassandra. And uh, until next week, I hope everyone has a, a good week. Take care. Bye-bye.